Um, welcome. Thanks so much for coming. This panel is entitled Engaging the Complexity and Peace Building, a Systems Perspective. So um, no one here probably would argue that peace building and conflict resolution processes are complex. They are. They're complex. They're messy. They're wicked. They're wicked and messy and complex problems and processes. And undoubtedly, we all experience the pain of that reality at some level every day in our organizations or in the communities that we work within. Sometimes it sh shows up as a confusion about what we're doing and why. Maybe it shows up as a difficulty communicating with our, our funders or our boards or our leader, you know, leaders that we're working with. Um, Sometimes it shows up as not being on the same page with the people you're working with or outright conflict. So, you know, it's not that we don't think of things holistically, we do. But the problem I think sometimes we have is being able to juggle all the complexities and put that together to kind of think about um, what we're doing and what kinds of effects we expect. So in setting up this panel, what I did is um, we have a really esteemed group for you, and each of them has a bio that just warrants um, me applauding them and, and telling you a lot about them. But I'm going to refer you, since we're on such short time, to the packets that actually have people's bio sketches. Um, but what I did in, in asking, pulling these folks together and asking them to speak to you is I asked them to think about what questions would you want folks to be asking about the context in which they work? And, and, and once they're asking those questions, what kinds of tools or ways of practicing would you be encouraging them to use to better answer or engage those questions? And sometimes that engaging those questions just means being able to ask better questions. Um, so I don't want to take any of their time in speaking to you, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over right away to uh, Mr. Robert Sigliano, who's going to get us started, and, um, and we'll go from there. And hopefully at the end we'll have a little time for questions. But if they haven't helped you see by the end of this how it is that you might be asking better questions of the context you work within and the work that you're doing and what kinds of tools you might be using, be sure to tackle them in the, at one of the breaks or in another session because that's what we're here to give you. So um, we'll get started. Thanks, Rob. Great. Thanks, Karen. Um, good, good morning, everybody. Um, happy to, to talk about um, my favorite subject. Uh, and um, I, first, I want to say that I could explain complexity and peace building to you, but it's just too complex, so you wouldn't you wouldn't get it. Um, so I won't go there. Uh, so I want to also say that uh, there is a certain difficulty in talking about um, complexity and systems approaches to peace building, in, in that um, it's hard to do that without implicitly criticizing all the good work that's happened in the past. I mean, great, granted, there are, there are good, bad, and, and ugly outcomes that we've had in this field. Um, I, I do a lot of work with a, a family of organizations or initiatives that, uh, under the umbrella of the Amidyar Group, and they did a, uh, this is um, funded primarily by the Pierre and Pam Amidyar, and uh, he's the founder of eBay, and so it's, it's the, um, it's the proceeds of that endeavor that they're, they're, they're pledging back. And they did a report uh, called The First Decade, The First Billion. So they had given a billion dollars in philanthropic resources to these various initiatives, um, peace building and social change. Hope Lab that um, Ari mentioned is one of their um, organization, organizations that they support. Um, and what's been great about that is, is that they said, look, we did great work. All these organizations did great work in the last 10 years, had great impacts, and we are wanting more. And, and that's hard. I work a lot with the people that, they've, that work in these organizations, and there's a bit, they feel that. Like, so we, didn't, we did something wrong? I mean, what was, and it's not that, it's just that we're, we're saying, let's look at a different way of being, different level of impact, and a different way of operating. So I wanna um, jump in on this. I wanna, these are the, my answers to Karen's uh, questions that she gave us, so if we we're that short on time, I could stop now, Karen, because this, this is the quick presentation. So the key question I, I want people to ask, or I wish they would ask, is, is what they're doing, is the issue they're working on, is the cause that they're championing, championing something that's fixable or something that's complex? And more, more directly or more, more, uh, more elaborately, is it, to what extent is what you're working on a fixable issue? Where if it took some resources, it took some technology, it took some information, and you would then get a sustainable and effective outcome, 
is it, to what degree is it that? And to what degree is it much more complex? It's much even harder to understand, let alone engage with and have impact on. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this, I, this concept of a systems practice, which is really not a specific tool, but it's a set of tools for how we engage that complexity. And I want to leave with, I think, the, the one fundamental, there's lots of changes I would see in our practice, but the fundamental one is to help us collectively and individually break out of what I would call the vicious, virtuous cycle, which basically says that we, it's, it's the very good uh, intentions and practices that allow us to be effective to the degree we are effective that actually undermines our ability to really engage systemically and holistically over the long term with many of these most difficult uh, problems. So uh, again, I think a lot of you know this list of, of issues um, that uh, I won't call a lot of attention to these, but there is a general feeling like there is something wrong, we want something more. <clears throat> I hear donor fatigue a lot, and I, I wanna call attention to the the fatigue that is felt by so-called beneficiaries, which I think is actually much larger than those that, that donors feel. Um, all of these are symptoms, I think, of this, this, this basic uh, problem. So the question that I talked about is, um, it's almost like we live on two different planets. Or we, there are two different ways of being effective in the world. There's the planet fixable world, where you actually can directly fix things. You can build a well and have access to fresh water in an in a, in a impoverished community. And then there's planet complex, where this, the, the, our best habits, our linear logic models, um, our engineering principles are much less helpful to us than they are um, in, in the planet fixable context. And so I want to just elaborate a little bit on what I see as the distinction around that question. So if we, if we uh, I'm uh, unlike Ari, I'm not a graphic artist or game designer, so these are not very uh, sophisticated graphics. Um, so if that black blob represents the context within your work, that's the Congo, that's um, Nigeria or, or Pakistan, and the yellow dot is the thing you care about, that's say poverty alleviation, gender empowerment, access to fresh water, whatever it is. What distinguishes planet fixable from planet complex is the degree of interrelationship, interconnection, between the thing you care about and the surrounding context. So if it's a relatively straightforward connection, that's fixable. So the, the simple example is like a spark plug in an engine. Um, it does interact with the rest of the engine, but it is not so interdependent on the rest of the engine that if the air filter breaks, the spark plug breaks. Right? So it, it is something you could actually fix by replacing the spark plug or repairing it in some way. Complexity says there is a much different interrelationship between the thing you care about and its surrounding context. And if that's the case, then this system, those, that, that sort of messy set of gray dotted arrows there, that is the point at which you need to engage. But because engaging directly in the problem, like going directly after the poverty or the fresh water, may not be the way to long-term sustainably address that issue. And so the, the challenge is, how do we address the system? And so fundamentally, that's the system's perspective to me. So that's the, for me, that's the reason why you ask that question, is if, you're, if you should be addressing the system, don't try to treat it like it's a fixable problem. So in a, a sort of simple example, that if you uh, take a, a village in, in, um, in Malawi, say, needs access to fresh water, is, that, is the reason why they don't have fresh water a function of the fact that they just need a well. If it is, dig the well. If it's much more interconnected, so the reason why they don't have access to fresh water is because there are entrenched economic interests. Someone gets paid to tote water from 10 kilometers away into the village three times a day. Is it about religious and clan conflicts? Is it about poor governance? Um, is the community taking its scarce resources and using it to bring in um, health practitioners? rather than access to in, in, spending it on fresh water? If that's the case, then you're in a complex situation. So ju just digging the well doesn't work. And, and actually, I, I use this example because I, I, I build off a, uh, a TED talk by uh, someone from Engineers Without Borders in Canada who gave a really illuminating talk about they, their project that dug 103 wells in villages in Malawi. After about a year and a half, 81 of them broke down. And, and it was largely because they were treating it like it was fixable 
and not because it was like it was complex. And that was really what the source of both the breakdown and the lack of repair came from that mess of, of gray errors, came from the, the system. And so what does that look like in terms of how we engage? This in some ways skips down, actually, Karen, to your third question. So if, if we're trying to do is engage the system, by engaging the system over time, we can improve whether that's a level of peace or a level of poverty, whatever you want to put on the, on the um, vertical axis is that engaging the surrounding system over time indirectly affects the issue we care about. It's just a different model of how we engage and how we be effective. So that's the fundamental sort of, for me, reason why you ask that question and what it does um, uh, to your practice. The, the, the second question, the what, so what are the tools? How do you, what do you do to do this? I, I break it down, this is my organization of my toolbox. So there are ways there are tools we can use to listen to the systems. So systems are very difficult. They, they, there's not like a label that says, here's the, here's the system of Congo. Um, it, it, they are mental constructs that can be very difficult. We run into huge problems of information management, which I'm sure, um, uh, Nate and Scott, you're gonna, you're gonna settle for us, right? Right, okay, um, so how do we do that? We, whether it's through a visualization technique, it's a, it's a, a data management technique, um, it, but it's still difficult, poses challenges, but there are ways to deal with this. Um, engaging the system, as opposed to intervening in it, we gotta get off of the, the, the um, addiction to uh, projects, which again, is really maybe structured by a lot of donors, that we wanna think about things that can be done in, in six months, a year, maybe two years at the most. Engagement doesn't have a beginning and an end. It doesn't have a before and an after, it has an always. And that's, a, again, a different way that we, we think about engaging, but there are also tools for engaging effectively. And same, same on, on learning and learning systems, so also I think a lot of what Scott and Nate may talk about it, the ways in which we, we do learn over time, we do learn from multiple and big data sources. Um, just a, a quick, I won't spend a lot of time talking about the tools, but things like systems mapping, uh, more holistic analysis of systems, uh, key things about engaging, finding leverage points in the system, working in networks, um, but really networks that are effective, that, that really lead to effective action. Uh, monitoring, outcome harvesting type approaches, building these larger learning infrastructures that are multi-party, uh, that in, in pull information and data out of lots of places that work across organizations. These are all um, just, again, some of the particulars in that toolkit. But I wanted to um, finish up with, with talking about um, the harder issue for me, which is this idea of the vicious, virtuous, cycle, and I think that, again, we all play a part in, and I play a part in, and we also play a part in both uh, e executing it and being stuck in it, but also disrupting it. So this is the system I think we are trapped in as peace builders in a lot of ways. And so the, the, it basically starts with this idea that there's a, there's a strong need and desire for assistance. There are any number of problems out there, right, that we could assist with. Which leads to those of us, like in, in this room, uh, in government and non-governmental organizations and academic institutions, feeling a need and a desire to help. And it drives us to this idea of fix. Can we find a fix? Can we alleviate suffering now? Can we open up the access to the fresh water? Can we help conduct an election? And that does lead to some positive impacts, which again, increases the desire, hey, that worked, let's do something else. But unfortunately, in the complex space, so in those areas of the world where we work, where there is true complexity at play, um, oftentimes those fixes tend to fail. So that either they're unsustainable, they, they, they last like the 18 months of the uh, well project I mentioned in Malawi, or they actually have negative impacts. So what looked like a good idea to begin with ended up ha having negative consequences because the system sort of was the empire strikes back. The system finds a way to counteract and undermine whatever that change was. Also, I think our attempts to sort of fix in the short term undermines our ability and our desire to engage for the long term. So it was like the question I asked to Senator Feingold about the fact that we don't, we tend to engage around crises and dramatic moments and not deep long-term underlying root dynamics and patterns that we see over and over but we just, we keep falling into again and again. So that, that for me is the vicious part of this, is, is the, the two sort of red parts of that diagram where we tend not to have incentives, we not, don't get rewarded, we don't get funded 
to engage deeper systems. Um, people in those bureaucracies know that there is a larger system at play, but say, and I and my program at USAID or wherever, I don't have the ability to structure funding, long-term, flexible, adaptive mechanisms that will allow you to, to use that systems practice that I mentioned. And so I guess what I want to leave you with is, is where are we in this, and how can we break out of it? And I'll, I'll come back to the work I do with uh, the Amidyar folks, is I'm, we're, we're, it's on a much smaller scale, but working with all layers within that organization, both the people who are writing the checks, the people who are leading the organizations, and the people who are executing, it's a microcosm of our peace building universe, um, but working at all those levels and having that a conscious effort where we sort of, what is it, the 12-step program start with, with awareness, right? And it, um, it's just even being aware of this, I think, is a huge step forward for us. And we have a role to play in that. Um, and I know people have to meet budgets and, and write grant proposals and all that. Uh, and uh, I think we do have the potential to address this and to not fall victim to it year in and year out. Thank you. That's me. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect timing. Where's my mouse? Um, Nate, you want to come up and get us? Uh, I don't know how. I'm a Mac. <laughs> Does anybody know how to do that? Yeah, where is it? Oh, is it? Oh, is it right there? maybe. Okay. There we go. Forget how to use a PC. Hello, everyone. Um, so as we all know, um, it used to be when we talked about conflict assessment and early warning, we were implicitly or explicitly talking about conflict between unitary and monolithic states. So the tools for assessing such things and for building peace around such a framework um, were very different than what they are now. Um, now we're concerned as much or more with um, intrastate conflict or cross-border conflict, and intrastate conflict could um, telescope down to every level of granularity. Um, you can be concerned about intercommunal conflict or intracommunal conflict, um, sectarian conflict, um, political conflict or criminal conflict. Um, so it, it's, it's become a much more um, complex and dynamic uh, problem that we're trying to, to deal with. So because of that, um, we've all accepted, you know, as gospel truth, that we need to be dealing with complexity. We have, there's a million models and tools and things, and we all recognize this. We know that we need to be thinking about second and third order effects. We know we need to be looking at cross-cutting issues. We know we need to be looking at the different variables and understanding the relationships between them, whether they're antecedent, independent, uh, interdependent, um, whether they're leading indicators or lagging indicators. Um, we recognize this. We know this. We, we know that we need to be looking at multi-level analysis because what happens at the state level looks very different perhaps than what's happening at the local level. So we've accepted this as, as truth. However, in practice, it's much easier said than done, perhaps. Um, in Nigeria, um, where I work mostly these days, um, it, I, I think Nigeria is, is, a, is, a, is, is a sort of the poster child for complexity. Um, you've got issues in the Niger Delta. Um, you know, you, you've got that trending in a, in a positive direction since the amnesty program in 2009. Meanwhile, you have, um, you have uh, the issues that we've been seeing on the news lately in the Northeast. Um, and then you have uh, issues in the Middle Belt, um, which are very different, although you know, some of the stuff in the Northeast is now affecting stuff in the Middle Belt. And likewise, as the election approaches um, in 2015, what's happening in both of those areas might start affecting what's happening in the Niger Delta. So it's extremely, it's extremely complex, and it's much harder to, to, uh, to address in practice than it is to simply accept the fact that, yes, it's complex and we need to take a systems approach to these things. So um, just quickly um, looking at um, specifically what happened in the Northeast recently, um, in 2009 there was uh, a, a, an insurgent uprising um, um, uh, in Bauchi, which then spread to Borno um, and a few other states. Um, after the, the leader of the, uh, of the uprising, um, Muhammad Yusuf, was killed, violence dropped down almost to baseline. And then in 2011, it began to spike um, increasingly. 
um, becoming worse and worse over the last couple of years. Um, in 2013, in May, there was an emergency, state of emergency declared. Um, and then um, in April 2014, there was the Chibok incident um, that, we've all, that we've all heard about. Um, so this is Borno State. This is the data we've been collecting through our, our, our systems and our networks. Um, and the red line is, is my Duguri. So that's the capital of Borno State. And you see at the very apex of that line, that's May 2013 when the amnesty program, sorry, when the uh, state of emergency was declared. You can see that it had a huge effect on the trend of violence, right? It dropped. However, those, the blue line that you see there is all the other local government areas in the state. And that had an extreme extremely adverse uh, trend uh, since, the, since the state of emergency was declared in May of 2013. So over here you see the, these heat maps. Um, before the state of emergency, you see almost all the violence was concentrated around Maiduguri. And then during the state of emergency, this is the, um, about six months later, um, you can see it's almost like there was a, a fist that, that, that stomped down and spread all the violence across the state. Um, so to me, this shows how hard it is to actually um, deal with um, a, a complexity or a systems approach. Too often, you, you hear in the public sphere, oh, they were doing too much, right, before the Chibok incident. They're being too aggressive. They're being way too hard um, in, in, in their approach. Um, and then after the Chibok incident, they're saying, oh, they haven't been doing anything. It's obviously much more complicated than that or, or complex than that. Um, we need to be taking a systems approach if we're going to be successful in, a, in dealing with all of this. So um, back to fundamentals now. We talk about second and third order effects. Um, Clearly, we need to do a better job of dealing with, 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 this, with, this, uh, with this factor. Whenever you have any kind of an, an intervention, it's not going to be enough just to defeat the enemy. You're going to have blowback, and you're going to have implications for um, civilians um, that are then exposed to insecurity as a result. So that has to be a part of your calculus. Um, you've got to look at cross-cutting issues, social, economic factors, political factors, security factors. You've got to look at gender as a cross-cutting issue and youth as a cross-cutting issue. Right now, one of my colleagues is um, in, in, in Kano, and she's doing a workshop to try to um, create some data around uh, violence against women and girls. Um, Antecedent interdependent variables, multi-level analysis. We talked about how it's very important to understand that it's not enough just to look at my at, at Borno State. You got to be able to look at the local government area levels as well. And most importantly, the framework has to be iterative, flexible, and relevant. And in order to be relevant, it has to be locally defined. You've got to have stakeholders on the ground who are defining what you're going to look at um, and how you're going to look at it. And finally, don't forget about the back burner. I mentioned Niger Delta um, as another dynamic um, in, in, in Nigeria. You can see, based on the data that we've been collecting, that um, the, uh, the, I said that it, it, it's been trending in a positive direction since the amnesty program. But in the last couple of years, as, as a measure of the number of incidences, it's been steadily climbing as we move towards an election in 2015. So we're all looking at Borno right now. But in a couple of you know, uh, six, eight, 12 months, we might have to be starting to look at other parts of the country as well. So don't forget about the back burner. So how can we, how can we do this? How can we begin dealing with um, issues of complexity um, when we look at a country like Nigeria, or any country for that matter? Um, what we try to do is we try to bring together data sets, um, whether it's the unlocked data set, uh, which is one that um, I've been working on in Nigeria now for a while, where we work with civil society to gather uh, uh, information on um, pressures on peace. Um, whether it's um, Nigeria Watch data set at the, at the University of Ibadan, whether it's the Nigeria Security Tracker uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations has a great data set, whether it's Accoled. Um, as of now, we have about seven or eight different data sets, and we're uploading those all the time and coding those. And we look at multiple um, sectors. So we look at demographic pressures, refugees, economic pressures, group grievance. And then you can drill down to about 70 different sub-indicators underneath that. And the purpose of this isn't just so that we can make pretty pictures pictures um, and, 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 and say, boy, isn't it complicated, but um, so, that, so that stakeholders can begin to, uh, to, to engage with the data in a practical way, um, whether you, it's the traditional leaders, whether it's the you know, uh, USAID conflict advisor in Abuja or anybody else. And finally, we try to um, map stakeholders. So we go out and have workshops all over the country, and people identify their organizations and initiatives as peace agents, um, and then we map that 
that so that folks who want to work on um, stakeholder mapping, networking, um, scoping um, can be more effective in that. And you can make that link between um, uh, the hotspots and, um, and who's doing what, where to address it. Um, delta state, just to illustrate another way this data can be looked at, um, you can drill down to the sub-indicator level and you can see this is a picture I took in northern delta state, which illustrates the conflict between pastoralists and farmers. But you can see how the issues have changed over the, over the years. Um, from militancy in 2009 to now, it's more about um, ethnic and communal tensions and, and criminality. So multi-stakeholder collaboration is essential. Um, without that, it's not going to work both on the data side and both on the implementation side. Um, uh, because people know different things. Uh, you need to have buy-in by everybody. They need to have collaboration. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to take this data back to the communities themselves, which is something that we're doing throughout the Niger Delta and the Middle Belt now. Um, you got to, because all of this will tell you a lot about patterns and trends. It will tell you nothing about causes and effects. Um, so to get to the causes and the effects, you need to have people on the ground who are working with the nitty gritty to actually analyze the patterns and trends and begin to strategize around, um, around solutions. So. Um, uh, that's the website where it's, 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 a, it's, an open, it's an open tool for anybody who's interested in Nigeria, the p4p-nigerdelta.org, and I've got a bunch of cards if people uh, would like to um, have that website um, and take a look at it. Very good. Thanks very much, Karen. Thanks to uh, Nate and Rob for setting up the, the conversation so well. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is, um, and, and what I'd like to do is show you a series of examples of how um, to navigate through complex systems and complex problems uh, using a, a mapping platform that um, has been developed by colleagues of mine in San Francisco, a new tech company called Vibrant Data, um, that uh, has, has just started embracing all kinds of challenges in this uh, space. And the basic message that I want to get across is that uh, when we confront the huge complexity that we often do in the conflict and peace building world, we don't have to despair or uh, bury our heads in the sand and push it to one side. We can actually embrace it dive headfirst into it and come out the other side with uh, some uh, simple but hopefully robust guidelines um, for uh, creating priorities about how to take action and how to intervene, or as, as Rob put it, um, uh, much better to engage with uh, the system in question. So <clears throat> I, I guess in terms of the, you know, the, the questions that, uh, that Karen set up for us, um, you know, what kinds of questions should we be asking in, in the peace building world and uh, what sort of tools should we be using? I just wanted to start <clears throat> with a question that I was asked uh, when I started my previous job at the Skoll Global Threats Fund. Um, I was told on day one that our mission was to find a transformative uh, or, or game-changing intervention that we could make in Middle East conflict, in, uh, in Israeli-Palestinian conflict in particular. Yes, laughter. So if you've been following the peace process lately, you'll know that I've failed completely and utterly and miserably in that, but I feel like I'm probably in good company there. John Kerry and Martin Indyk couldn't fix it either, so I don't feel so bad. Um, but what, what I did uh, at least take out of that was to begin to grapple with what that question actually meant. What, is it, what would it mean to, to create a transformative intervention? And in the process of grappling with that question, it led me to this collaboration with my colleagues at Vibrant Data, uh, and um, this, uh, uh, and, and, and some of the, the work that I'm, that I'm going to talk about today. So, um, just perhaps to frame that question in, in a different way: um, How, when we have a multitude of options for engaging with a conflict system, how do we choose one over the other, and on what basis do we make that decision? How do we justify that decision as having greater or, or lesser likelihood of success? Um, also, how do we avoid what uh, Daniel Goleman called in a recent book, uh, systems blindness? That is, the, the possibility that we'll make an intervention at some point in the system and then get totally blindsided when that intervention unleashes a cascade of effects that circles around and, and hits us from behind in, an, in some sort of uh, unforeseen way. 
and we've all heard examples of that, and, and Rob and Nate just um, spoke quite eloquently on that point as well. So in trying to avoid that, it, it occurred to me that you know, the first thing you would need to do, um, at, le at the very least, was to create some kind of map of the system. So you had some kind of um, idea of the basics of the architecture of the system. So you wouldn't be entirely groping in the dark. And exactly where that led us in, in the Middle East, I'll, I'll circle back to. But for now, I, j I just want to take a, a, a sideways leap. And here is a map of a complex system. And we all know this beautiful example that was hit the front page in the New York Times and was on the Daily Show. And everybody took a shot at it and had a bit of a laugh about it, because it was, uh, how could you possibly understand something like this, right? Um, so I think there's a, there's a serious point to, made here, to, to be made here, which is I th that whenever we see something like this, I think we're paralyzed by two extreme urges, one of which is to uh, try and understand the system as a whole all at once and say something meaningful about it, which causes our head to explode very rapidly. Uh, and the other is to try and zoom down and zero down on one particular issue, screen out the complexity, and just hope to God that you can intervene at this point and everything else is equal and you don't have to worry about uh, the system effects that we know might be lurking in the background. What I want to talk about today, I guess, is, some, is, a, is kind of a middle way, where um, a, a technique for stripping down systems like this to uh, something manageable, something that can give you uh, a strategic roadmap that's simple enough to be comprehensible and to be actionable, but at the same time, uh, which still takes into account those system properties and hopefully doesn't lead to you get bl getting blindsided. So around the same time I was grappling with my challenge, my, my colleague uh, Eric Berlow, who's the founder of Vibrant Data, was uh, decided to use this opportunity to give a TED talk um, a, a, about this issue. Um, and you know, he, to, to make a simple point about the, the kind of methods that you could use to reduce these complex problems to something more manageable. And he started with, um, by converting this into a, a network diagram and um, starting with, the, with the, the point that the, the whole objective of this was to increase popular support for the Afghan government. And if you, if you then turn this map into an ordered network, um, this is what it looks like. And if you look uh, one, two, three degrees of separation away from that ultimate goal, then uh, actually the network reduces quite quickly in size to about uh, a, a quarter of its original size. Um, Eric's actually published some work in the Pre Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences suggesting that even you know, going two or three degrees of separation away is perhaps more than you need to, that often uh, effects in these networks are quite localised to the first and second connections. Um, but then you can look more closely at these 25 connections, and you can categorize them into different categories. If, for example, you were a, a nonviolent civil society actor trying to get involved and, and engage with this conflict somehow, you might uh, screen out those that are not actionable, things like the terrain. You might um, exclude actions that require military capability. Uh, and you might come down to uh, actions that, as a civil society organization, you could actually take. And there's about seven of them uh, colored in orange there. And you, you might notice that they can also be grouped into two main categories. So after starting with this incredible hairball of a, of a complex map, all of a sudden you're down to a, a couple of um, sort of basic strategic directions that you could potentially uh, take back to your organization, you could take to your community uh, of NGOs and, and, and try and move in the same direction to engage with the conflict. So to be fair, um, you know, that was a bit of a throwaway example. Everyone was using that as a throwaway example. Eric's not an Afghanistan expert. He didn't develop this analysis in consultation with Afghanistan experts, as ideally you should. Uh, but I want to switch gears now and talk about an example where he has just done that uh, on the issue of personal data, on an issue that's increasingly um, pervasive in our society and increasingly pervasive in, in peace building and conflict. So the challenge. Um, is to do with the personal data economy. Um, and uh, Intel Labs actually came to Vibrant Data with a question, uh, which was, what are the core challenges at the root of the personal data economy, and how can we influence them? So if data is the new oil, as is often said, uh, how can personal data be uh, made to work to the benefit of the public at large, rather than having people be uh, exploited as a result of it? So they gathered 50 experts on this issue and asked them to name the key challenges in this uh, arena. They came out with about 100 different issues. 
So this is you know, clearly a complex system. Uh, things like um, the growth of a market for data services, the development of tools to anonymize personal data, uh, the ability to see personal data exhaust, increasing the amount of data voluntarily shared, and, and so on. And then they asked how each of these 100 or so issues are connected to each other. Are they, well, are they connected, and if so, how? So, for example, if um, you make an improvement or you solve one of these challenges, does it make every other challenge in the system easier or harder? So, for example, if you develop tools to anonymize personal data, you might increase the amount of data that, that's voluntarily shared. So, an improvement in one node leads to an improvement in another. That's not necessarily the case. Some of them might go the other way. So, they looked right across the system and Lo and behold, um, once you go through every single pair of issues, they came up with about 6,500 uh, different links. And so, you know, we're back where we started again with this horrible hairball that's very intimidating and makes you want to run away. So what, what do you do now? Um, so this is the key point that I want to make today, is that uh, as awful and impenetrable as this looks to begin with, it does have structure. There is structure within it, and you can look for it, you can find it, you can tease it out, and you can use it to your advantage. <clears throat> so, for example, uh, you can look at the asymmetry between links. So, for every, for every issue in this network, does it have a lot of links uh, going out of it, affecting other issues, and not very many coming in, which is something you might like? So you don't have much competition to influence that particular node, but if you do influence it, it, it impacts a lot of other things. You can also look at how strong are the effects that that um, particular node has on, on other, on other um, issues in the system. And uh, you can end up with this subset of issues that have a disproportionately strong effect on a disproportionately large number of other issues in the system. And you might argue that that is uh, a subset of issues that maybe fit the definition of transformative, potentially transformative or potentially uh, catalytic. They then ask the experts to look more closely and zoom in on that group of issues and uh, see if they could be categorized in any, in any way. And they, they managed to categorize them into four different uh, groups and then came out with these sort of what they call four grand challenges of the new personal data economy, platform openness, data literacy, digital access and digital trust, which Intel Labs are now uh, creating incubators around to try and engage with the space. So an example of how you can get from something terribly complex to something relatively, system, uh, s relatively simple. So I mentioned we, we were looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We did uh, a, a similar kind of process, uh, at least a pilot process, with a small group of experts uh, to ask the question, uh, you know, what issues could impact the ability of a nonviolent movement to uh, get to a successful resolution of the conflict, defined in terms of creating security, mutual recognition and reconciliation, and civil, civil and political rights for all parties concerned. Uh, we identified 73 issues, 1,874 links, and uh, identified six issues with that characteristic of, of high link asymmetry. That is, not many issues affected them, but they affected many others. We also looked at, at positive and negative feedback loops. To go to Rob's point about vicious and virtuous cycles, um, if a, a, an issue is embedded in a positive feedback loop, its effects could potentially be amplified. So if you improve uh, that issue, if it then links to others that feed back and amplify it again, then you can, you can get into a, a vicious or virtuous cycle depending on uh, whether you want that thing to happen or not. So there were you know, a, a number of, this is very much work in progress still, but there were a number of promising signs there that, that we could actually whittle that very complex uh, system down as well. We've also been um, uh, dabbling with a, a visualization of the regional dynamics in Syria, which we think also has some potential. But I want to finish with uh, uh, on, on, a, on a slightly different note, it doesn't have to be issues that are the nodes in the network. It can also be organizations. You can look at the ecosystem of organizations and, and ask the question, does the ecosystem of organizations that you, that you work with have a structure and can we use that structure to identify uh, potential synergies, inefficiencies, um, overlap, and, and new ways that, that we could collaborate together, for example. So this is uh, data from the water and sanitation um, uh, water and sanitation funding space. This is from data from um, Brad Smith and his team at the Foundation Centre. And um, 
it's a clustered network diagram of, of funding organizations. Every node is a funding organization, and they're clustered together if they fund all, a, a lot of the same grantees, and they're far apart if they don't fund many of the same grantees. And you can see that using this clustering algorithm, it sort of sorts out into about eight different funding communities, which are colored different here. Um, but you can also zoom in and have a look at the funding profiles of individual organizations. So Google.org is sort of funding um, in, a, in, in, a, in a small space with relatively similar funders. The Gates Foundation has a, has a more diverse profile. Um, Hilton Foundation, a more diverse profile again. And even uh, smaller organizations like the Peninsula Community Foundation is really sort of punching above its weight in terms of funding a, a real a high diversity of different organizations with a, a relatively few grants. So uh, I'll leave it there, but I just want to finish with, uh, you know, just reinforcing a couple of simple messages um, that we don't have to be paralyzed by complexity, uh, that we, we do have tools uh, uh, now that can help us navigate through complex problems and extract some simple guidelines for prioritizing action. We, uh, even, even the most messy complex problems have structure to them. And if you can extract that structure, you can find it and, and put it to your advantage and make it work for you. Uh, and lastly, nothing that I've talked about today will ever be a substitute for granular expert knowledge. In fact, every, all these analyses are built on top of granular expert knowledge. And once they're done, they should be returned uh, to experts to decide whether they make any sense or not and um, how exactly they should be implemented. At the end of the day, these analyses are not uh, about providing answers, really, so much as they are about hopefully enabling people to ask better questions uh, about uh, the system that they're engaging in. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanking you for framing so clearly what the questions are about systems and systems thinking and the path that goes from seeing patterns to working with them. So there are two main distinctions that we see in the systems thinking. One is using these models and methods to look backwards. So how can we use the data, the perspectives, the relationships, the linking models, the networks to see what happened in the past? And there are lots of wonderful models and methods to do that. And that was where I began my work in, in systems. But I'm also an actor. I'm a decider. I'm a leader. I am a practitioner. And so that wasn't enough for me. I needed a way to think about systems that would take me forward and lead into action as well as sight. Now, it's important to be able to see the patterns. It's very important to see the patterns. And you can learn lots from them. And in a moment of action, you need patterns that will also lead into action. The other piece is a distinction between system models that come from the top, deductive models, where you have a conception, a picture, an understanding of the pieces that would be important, and then you build a systems map from your beliefs down into reality. The other is an inductive model, where you take data, as Nate does, and you build up from the detailed data. So as you're thinking about doing systems work, those are two very important questions you need to ask. Are you looking back with your systems work? Or are you looking forward? And are you going from ideas to a system model? Or are you going from data up into a systems model? No naughty or nice. They're all useful, but they're important questions to ask. Now, what I want to share with you today is a theory of change that is based on one particular systemic perspective. So I love the question this morning about what would be the, the theory of change for the gamers in peace. And I think this is a theory of change that works with gaming, though I loved his uh, solution that the theory of change builds the game and not the other way around is lovely. So what I'd like to do is to define for you the way we think about systems. Now, this is a complex adaptive system, individual agents, they have the freedom to act in unpredictable ways, but when they interact, patterns emerge that are systemic patterns. 
agents, interactions, and patterns. So you can imagine that there would be multiple ways that the agents might interact. And as they do over time, the pattern appears. Now this pattern can be a peaceful pattern or a conflictual pattern. It can be a pattern for an individual in terms of fear or courage or wisdom. Or it can be a community pattern of ethnic or cultural uh, perspectives or rituals or choices. It can be a political pattern of governance at any level. Patterns emerge over time. Now those patterns then constrain the actions of the agents in the next cycle of coming to be. So once a pattern begins to form, the degrees of freedom for the agents in that system are constrained in the future. And so we have agents, interactions, and patterns, and then perpetuating the pattern in the action of the agents. Now this is happening at many scales in many ways. And if you begin to think about the peace and justice context in which you're looking, and you think about this kind of causality, not A causes B, or even nonlinear causality, A causes B causes A, but if you think that this is the way that patterns of peace or conflict emerge, then there are three really important questions you want to ask. What are the agents that are engaged? And that's the kind of work that you're doing, Scott, is finding what those agents are. How do they interact? And interactions can be physical, social, informational, with money. What are the interactions that are there? And finally, what are the patterns that are showing up? What are the agents? What are the connections? And how are they engaged? What are the boundaries that lie among sets of agents? How can you change the conditions at the local level so that the pattern shifts itself, right? So an intervention does not become, we're going A to B. An intervention becomes, how do we look at the existing system, understand the conditions that are shaping the pattern that exists, and then influence those conditions so that different patterns might emerge. Now the trick is you can't predict what's going to emerge because you're not the only one setting conditions for that system. So these are questions that you can ask if you think possibly this is the way things are happening. Now the next set of questions is if you see a pattern in this way, how do you deal with the fact that you can't predict or control what's going to happen? in response to your intervention. And so all of you talked about the fact that action had to be flexible, iterative, local, sensitive, <laughs> multiple scale, and we call that adaptive action. And it's three questions. What? What do you see? What do you think? What are you thinking? So what? And obviously the last question, we could do it in unison, right? Now what? So what's the current pattern that's coming out of this complex system? So what does it mean in terms of the potential for violence or nonviolence, for support, health, coherence, or dissonance? Now what can I, given the resources and access that I have in this moment, what can I or my institution do to shift those conditions? But because the system is complex, because we at least part of the system is living in Rob's cloud, we have to think, well, now what's going to happen? So that total iterative engagement with the system, what, so what, now what? So as each of you was talking, I was thinking about the ways in which this is an operationalization of the complexity that you were looking at. One other important distinction and set of questions that I'd like to ask, oh, adaptive action can be very short, in fact, we find that practitioners in the field do this spontaneously and very well. And the distinction between someone who is good in a moment and not good in a moment is the quality in which they do this process. It can also be very long term. One of our associates is working with the World Bank and looking at agricultural policy from an adaptive action perspective at multiple scales. So it can be microscopic, macroscopic, same process. One other distinction I want to share with you, and this is also one that everyone else has pointed toward. We like to talk about the distinction between a finite game 
and an infinite game. And a finite game, you know what the boundaries are, you know what the measures are, you know what the goal is, you can get better and worse. There is such a thing as prediction and control and expectation, and the purpose of such a game is to win. These were the ones that you were talking about, Rob, in terms of let's solve this problem. Is this a fixable problem? If the problem is fixable, if it's a finite game, there's a fix and there's an expert who knows it and you can get them in to fix it. Unfortunately, those aren't our real sticky issues. We get stuck on the others. The others are infinite games. And an infinite game has no boundaries, has no set scorecard, has many, many different ways to keep score. You don't know who the players are and who the observers are, and they switch all the time anyway. And someone can be your opponent and then your partner. Is this sounding familiar in many of the contexts that you're working in? Infinite game. And the purpose of these games is to keep playing, not to win or to lose. So that what you're doing perpetually, and this I think is what Rob was talking about is engagement, is engaging with that system to play an infinite game. Now, you can play a finite game inside an infinite one, so you can zoom in on an individual project. You can put in a well, even though you know the real issue is a cultural transformation and, and climate change in the community. You can go in and do a finite game and put in a well, and know still that that's in the context of an infinite game. So you zoom in and do a fix that is possible. You zoom out and realize that you're continuing to play the game. And so it isn't that either one of these is the only way to play. To have capacity in both and to be able to choose wisely. What are you seeing, finite or infinite? So what does it mean? for your options for action. Now what can you do? And then yet again, what, so what, now what? So the questions that you'd ask would be, what game are you playing? So what game is most fit to purpose in this moment? Should we be playing a finite game or an infinite game? And how do we go about doing that? And now what? can we do to frame that game in the deeper complex system where there are the parts becoming coherent as individuals or families, the whole becoming coherent as larger governance spaces, political spaces, cultural groups, and the greater whole, which is the massive interdependency of the multiple scales that you're looking at. What, so what, and now what? And there are resources here which we'll share, and I'm hoping that we'll have a good opportunity to speak more. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Great. So we do have some about 20 minutes for discussion. Thank you, everybody, for your comments and for um, being so succinct. And amazingly, I was worried that when I saw the slide decks, I'm like, Please be sure it's not more than 15 minutes and you all were fantastic, so thank you. We've got time to, to talk. And since um, I'm up front and got the mic, I'm gonna start, but I will open it up here in a minute. Um, and I wanna kind of draw attention to um, the role of visualization in grappling with complex systems. I mean, all of you at some level have really talked about visualization. Um, we talked about you know, the problem with levels of analysis and the connections. No one really talked about time, but obviously time is in there. Um, some things happen slowly, some things happen fast, and some things are truly dynamical, where some very small input to the system <laughs> creates a, di a whole dynamic that you would never have imagined. I mean, the reality is, is these are unbounded systems, and we can drill down, but we are working with infinite games and agents that um, have changed, changed the rule sets for us regularly. So, I guess I want to see if you guys can help us a little more effectively speak to the role of visualization in, as a practice and in working with our communities and our colleagues as a means to reify some section of the system 
so that we can align ourselves more effectively for not only for that first step of action, but for, for the learning. And then I, and also if we could talk about, and I don't know, I, I think we will have a space to put more resources, but some of these things are high tech and what some of us are in environments where we need really low tech solutions. I mean, we need techniques that help us to visualize and, and, and elicit these kinds of things um, without the data required for a heat map or, or you know, the complex networks. You know, what kinds of things are available to us to, to start to do this with our communities and our networks to, to not just have this, um, a, a non-holistic and a non-systemic. So sorry, it was, so basically like the, the role of visualization and, and I guess you, since we haven't heard from you for a while, Rob, I'll start here. Um, so so one, one thing that all the visualization techniques have in common, and, and I actually wanna place those on a continuum from more quantitative models and more qualitative sort of maps mm -hmm. of, uh, of a system. That all of them though are, I think what they have in common is that they are ways to help you see the whole even though you are stuck in a piece. And those that you're working with are stuck in pieces. And until you can see the whole, you, you, it, it's just like any, any you know, it's like looking at the Grand Canyon from the top of the ridge and down in the valley. I mean, it's, or from, from you know, 10,000 feet up. And, and different possibilities will suggest themselves. And I want to maybe call attention to two, I think, really important impacts of the visualizations. One is on the more qualitative side, um, visualizations become, uh, the, these more complex systems maps that I, that I work with are, um, are really just narratives. They're rich stories that capture the, a wealth of information, mm -hmm. but tell you the interconnections and talk about the, the patterns that talk about the so, help you get to the so what that you were talking about, Glenda. And, and so you can think of that, the narrative, and, and this all goes to the low tech question. So these are the most ancient yeah. form of like human technology is the story. Right. And if you change the story, if you get people to tell the story from the perspective of the whole, they see what they should do, they see their agency, they see opportunities, mm -hmm. um, as you were saying, Glenda, what, they see the what to do differently Mm -hmm. If looking from that point, and um, I, I've had a couple of experiences in presenting systems maps to um, a, an audience that tends to have a very short attention span, systems maps which are ambassadors uh, in, in various missions. And in both cases, in the one case, the, the, this one ambassador went from being highly skeptical, we could show her anything she didn't already know about this particular country, um, to having viewed the systems map, and I'll credit Chip Walker, who's in the audience, be the master who presented it. Um, at the end of it, she said, when the systems maps went up, my eyes kind of glazed over, uh, but it was the most useful presentation I had ever heard, in this case, Cambodia. And, and that's where this, it was just the power of the story you're able to tell from the map. The map becomes a table of contents mm -hmm. for telling this rich story and holding truth that you really can't hold by knowing any one piece mm -hmm. or looking at any one event. The other one is, uh, I want to share a, a, a person I met a, a couple months ago who is a particle physicist. And he, he's, his name is Garrett Lisi. He's got a TED Talk, so L-I-S-I, Lisi. Um, and, and in his TED Talk, he talks about um, more of like the pictures that Nate and Steve were, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about, which is um, looking at, he took all the subatomic particles that are known. So there's a couple dozen of them, right? And I can't tell you what they are. Um, and he looked at eight dimensions of relationships. We plotted eight dimensions of relationship, which I can totally begin to explain to you. But what was really fascinating about this is that they produced these diagrams, they produced these visualizations that suggested where new particles might be found. Mm. And he said, by looking at the visualization, you could see patterns, and in those patterns, you could see gaps. And in those gaps, you could theorize what should be there, mm. and then physicists could start looking for those things. And that's how they go through the process of, of under, uh, theorizing and then experimenting and uncovering these various particles. And I think there's an analogy, it's not quite as neat on the, on the peace building side, but, but we can look at those maps. Mm. And now that we see key leverage points, or we see gaps or, or opportunities that we wouldn't see if we didn't see the pattern. Nate, can you tell us anything? I mean, are, are these kinds of um, heat maps, you know, are they easily accessible or is it something also we could do in a low-tech way with communities? Well, what, what we do is we recognize that our local partners might not have good internet access, for example, 
Um, so we 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 try to produce bulletins and 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 publications and things, and then also recognizing that that, that they might not have email, we then go and take it to them, yeah. and we have a discussion around it. Yeah. Um, so uh, we found that you know people who are like living in a particular local government area in a particular state, they um, they you would think that they might know everything about the the conflict dynamics um, mm -hmm. that they could just reel it off. But when they look at a map, mm -hmm. um, new insights definitely emerge. Mm -hmm. And so um, we do find that a hard copy is essential um, mm -hmm. for actually stimulating that kind of discussion. Um, yeah. But um, and then at the national level, we work with um, you know a, a working group with the larger NGOs and, and the donors and, and things, and, and then we 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 have a more high tech um, engagement with the platform. But but yes, um, it, a low tech option is absolutely essential for our particular tool if it's going to be successful at engaging the local stakeholders right. in the process. That's awesome. And I guess you know similarly, Scott, like have you some of these tools that you're doing? Um, you know, do you do you imagine could people draw simple, um, you know, maps of connections? I mean, it wouldn't be quite the same, but are, do you imagine that there are ways that um, you could start to map your networks or your stakeholders or your organizations or and how close they are to an issue and do that kind of thing? And then how would you how do you use those with policymakers or or communities? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I think the tool that that, that we produced is is. Uh, I think it's of relevance to the peace building community here in terms of figuring out where to engage with um, with communities on the ground. You obviously, if if you if you want to use the platform, you need an internet connection at a you know at a minimum. Um, and you know, technology is hard to build and it's and it's complicated. But once the the platform is designed to be as simple to navigate as, as possible, um, one point I would make, and I just want to go back to what you said about the the time aspect of this mm -hmm. that. What we're doing, you know, generally when you create a systems map, and it's a snapshot of a continuous process. Right. So, um, you know, you, you create this map, you put it on put it on the wall, and and six months later, in a sense, it's out of date. And you know, one of the hidden assumptions of what we were doing, I guess, is that all of these connections exist. These 1,900 connections amongst different issues in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The default assumption is they're all acting similarly at the same time, whereas right. in fact, you know, a right. few of them will be on the front burner today. Some will, some different ones will be on the front burner six months from now. Um, so there's not an easy way to get around that. But one point I wanted to make, which may not have been um, immediately obvious, is that this is not a, intended as a snapshot. This is intended, you know, so in the personal data economy example, we've got 50 experts in the room. And the idea is to create engaged communities of experts mm -hmm. who will continuously, iteratively use this platform to improve their understanding of the system as it changes over time. It's not a sort of once for all time mm -hmm. thing. Um, there's actually you know, embedded in that platform a spreadsheet that can drop out that has all the data in it that anyone in the community can edit and update at any given time. So it's. Um, it's an iterative process, and it can be done, you know, if there's an internet connection or if there's um, a possibility for collaboration with communities in um, the conflict zones that we're talking about. And the one other thing I'd mention is that when what participants in these workshops universally said was that just the, the richness of the conversation as they tried to decide what are the issues, how should we bound them, how should we define them, and how should we decide whether they're connected or not, was in itself right. an enormous virtue that in, in their sort of narrow day to day, they never took a step back and yeah. considered the system like that. So everyone found that very beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if that's done in collaboration with communities on the ground, it can be a really rich source right. of engagement, as I said, which can be iterative right. over a long period of time. Well, I'm going to jump on that, and I know Glenda will have some thoughts because I think one of the ideas too is that um, these reifications, these little maps or these diagrams, are really meant to be, you know, continuous, and so it really does in involve developing a set of practices and and communities of people who want to work in this way. And Glenda, I know you work with some organizations that are trying to do that. I mean, is there some things you can tell us about how you get people engaged in that way? Um, you know, why does it take this someone really convening to pe for people to realize, wow, we should be having this conversation more often and more regularly, and then everybody runs back into their hole, you know? And uh, I, I mean, I, I'd love to see, you know, where, where those things are taking place. And I'm, after this, I'll open it up. Um, Open up here, yeah. yeah. 
Well, there's so many points in what all of you have brought up that are really, really key. And I think one of them is that the model itself is an occasion for conversation. Right. So it's a, an occasion to collect relevant data. It's an occasion to make sense of that relevant data. It's an occasion to build action together. And so that's, I think it's really important. Sometimes our complexity folks think that the complexity is an end in itself. Yeah. But it's really a means for setting conditions for a better conversation. So keeping that in mind is very helpful. Uh, one of the things about that that makes it much more tractable in a group is to realize that you're not modeling the world. Mm -hmm. So often when people start to do a model, they think they have to model everything. But if you say instead, as the French do, problematique, right? Mm -hmm. So you're modeling an issue, modeling a challenge, modeling a question, then it helps you simplify the models from the get-go. Yeah. So it's a, a smaller set of agents to interact with. Um, and the fact that there are multiple methods. So no one of these methods is going to be right. Sometimes it'll be one, sometimes it'll be another. So the broader capacity you have for systems approaches, the better off you'll be. Then in terms of the way that we visualize in just grassroots fundamental is that when we talk about a pattern coming out of a complex system, we say there are three things that mark the pattern. How are things the same? How are they different? And how are they connected? And if we can just get a group to talk about how, in a problem, what's the same, what's different, and what's connected, then that's a model that they can begin to work from. Mm -hmm. So even that very simple kind of conversation helps people not just get a better picture of the whole, but a shared picture of the whole, so that everybody has put into the same picture. So the notion that, that um, we work with is this idea of collective sense making. Yeah. And, and uh, also, Peter Woodrow is in the audience who's back there from CDA. But uh, we, we were working on a, presenting a map once, and, and someone who was a mathematician said, oh, I get what you did. You did performance art. And what he meant was it wasn't so much the map that was important. It was the act of creating it and interpreting it and living it and talking about it. That was what was important. And Rob dances on the stage when he talks about his map. So. Interpretive. <laughs> Interpretive systems. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and start taking. If people don't mind like speaking loudly, I can just. We don't have to get to mics or whatever. No, they do. And oh, oh, they want. Asked. Sorry, okay. the people on the webcast, if you could wait to um, ask your question until you have a mic, that would be great for all those let's, watching online. Let's get a mic to Dan Rothbart, because I know his name. And then the gentleman, let's see, oh, sorry, we had, how about if we come down here and get a mic there? And then go ahead, Dan. I'm Dan Rothbart, uh, School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. I'd like to thank the panelists for really uh, providing an, a, an exciting perspective here um, that's very valuable in many contexts. Mike. Um, concern or question is uh, the, involves the use of this for interventions. Um, it, it seems to me, I'm reading between the lines here, that um, it, to determine whether an intervention is positive or negative, um, that itself raises a, a whole series of questions about predictability. And since the systems are in a, in a complex system, mm -hmm. And that complexity is not only at one level, but it's at multi-levels, as, as was implied, even at a microscopic, even complexity of people in a room, in a dialogue session, um, in a mediation, could be considered a complex system. Mm -hmm. So the, my question is, how do you deal with that, the layers of complexity with prediction that seems to be necessary to determine whether it's positive or negative. I'm going to go ahead and take another one before we start, and, and maybe even one more. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm Matt Levincher from George Washington University. Uh, I was very taken by a couple of remarks in this panel. One was this, this notion of the transformative intervention, which seems it's a lovely, uh, a lovely ideal. Uh, and then on the more sobering side, Karen's comment about, we should have this conversation more often, <laughs> and then everyone goes back into their hole. And uh, I think we've, we um, have conversations about transformative interventions, and then we return to our respective holes. And that, that is, um, uh, so, so I th what, I, what I applaud about this panel is that you're really encouraging us to think and act more systemically. So um, 
the question is that, that I have and that I'm grappling with in my own work is how do you transform networks of information sharing into networks of action? Um, and it seems to me the transformation we're looking for is to build communities that act in concert uh, rather than simply understand the situation in concert. And how do you build that? How do you sustain that? Okay, and unfortunately, I've been, I'm getting the, because we're, we're gonna have to start a video in four minutes, so we have the, the idea of the causality question and how we can judge our interventions and the, the, the need for an understanding, you know, what are pro the problem with causality, and then Matt's question about this, the transformative um, aspects of working systems. So who can I get, who can I get to start? Want to start, Scott? Yeah, I can just say on the, on the positive negative thing, I, if I understand the question right, I think it's, there's, there's never any substitute for having a clear objective um, when you're in, in, in engaging with any problem. And I think in the Afghanistan example, it was popular support for the government. In the Israeli-Palestinian example, we had those sort of three benchmarks for um, you know, getting towards a resolution of the conflict. And I think you, you, you judge your engagement or intervention based on um, you know, whether they're bringing you closer to or further away from uh, those objectives. So it's, you know, it's not a matter of just, you know, engaging at, at, at any random point with the system, but, but keeping in mind how it's ultimately um, reverberating through the system to have an impact on the, the ultimate objectives that you're interested in. Um, Anybody else? Or go ahead, Rob. Uh, so I just, just maybe to Dan's question a little bit, is that, that so one is I'd say, um, uh, prediction is much less important than learning. And so e even though it will be difficult to predict how to affect a certain part of a system or a dynamic within a system or even a factor within a dynamic within a system, you want to be in a situation where you're set up to learn whether in fact you had it right, either the understanding of the system or how to engage it right. Um, and then to the degree that you're not, you're set up to be able to, to, to adapt. And so I, I, I use the phrase fail smart. You want to be set up at the least, if you're going to fail, fail smart. So you minimize the damage and you maximize your potential to learn um, 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 fr from what you do. And the other one is that I work a lot with people on goal setting and they want to set goals in terms of substantive deliverables, which you can maybe do in a one, maybe two, three year frame. You can't do in a five year frame. When you're talking that far out, you've got to talk about um, changes to underlying dynamics and patterns, not just to <laughs> events or conditions. And that, I think, hooks the first question to the second question. Because things are uncertain in infinite games. There's nothing that's going to make it certain. So the question is, do you have a way to deal with that certainty or not? And if you do, then how do you move into action and so the only way that you become more certain about the system behavior that you learn is to do something. And so it leads into this adaptive action cycle. So when someone or a group is talking, 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 it's an information sharing space, they're stuck in what we call the so what space. And if they'll just do something and see how it affects the system, they'll get unstuck. They'll begin to move again. So this whole question about the adaptive action doesn't always work, but when it doesn't work, you can have some idea what to do. And it doesn't really matter what they do, to some extent, just to do something so that the system begins to move. Okay, I, I'm getting the, the wrap up. Can, can you do it in 30 seconds? Yeah, sure. Uh, just a very Sorry. quick response to the, the, the problem of everyone going back into their holes after having these wonderful, rich conversations. I think that was the purpose of creating a, a platform that can be a, a visual representation of a consensus, um, expert consensus about a, the, the shape of a problem and promising and less promising points for intervention. Uh, and, to, and to keep that platform alive and keep that conversation keep people returning to that same conversation over and over. The reason I think people go back into the holes is just too, it's been too hard up till now yeah, to keep yeah, a complex system yeah, there. And yeah. I think we've got the tools to do it now. So please, at breaks, I'm gonna to have to wrap it up here, but please at breaks and across the next couple days, engage these folks, engage each other. I think there are places on the website where we can put up resources. Um, I think there's low tech resources, there's high tech resources that are now open source and platforms that can help you with your data. And I think right now we're about to start a video. Thank you very, very much for coming. Um, and we're
Hopefully she's full.